Um, I mean, I, I think you know what you're doing is really cool, and we, we'd like you know I, I I I wear a bunch of different hats. I'm I'm yeah. the dean of the School of Science Engineering, and then I run an additive pretty pretty big additive fabrication lab where we work a lot with companies in the region, and then. We sort of we act really as the consultant for Lowe in building this maker space, uh -huh. and you know, and I think what you're doing, we'd like to figure out some way to work with you with one of those hats. And I I know, um, Novo is always interested in anything that's sort of open source, um, and we're very interested in that as well. Um, mm -hmm. and I I guess where I wasn't sure, and and maybe you can. So it, when I saw uh, sort of the list of the equipment, um, I mean, basically the maker space is going to be, you know, sort of a wood shop, metal shop, mm -hmm. uh, fiber shop, and digital fabrication. And I saw a few things. 3D printing is kind of one area where we really, you know, we, we kind of have that pretty much covered. Um, I don't know if there's something particularly special about the 3D printers you're making relative to like the Voron open source. Uh, let's, let's hit that one so we knock that one off the table. So the thing is that um, it depends on your time scale, but the thing is we design a system that's highly scalable, but the other thing is we have our design allows itself for easy retrofit with a high temperature heated chamber. So our okay. interest is really being able to access all the plastics because Obviously, without the heated chamber, you're highly limited. So we want to basically take bales of scrap from the recycling center, shred them, turn them into filament, and then print them. As far as the house that we're working on, actual 4 by 8 full modules, that's our goal. So far, we've printed just minor things like little plumbing fittings and things like leaf eliminator and other things. But the real deal is if you can take the bulk, meaning you've got a thousand pound bale that you're shredding and now you're actually talking about materials handling and real real construction and building materials. So as simple as even printing um, printing things like plastic lumber, which if you go to the store, that stuff is expensive and it's yeah, uh, right. stuff like that. Um, S but that does not happen without the chamber. Now, last we, we did not get there yet. We have a design and it bypasses the patents. It's a super simple design because we have a fixed Z height design. So the bed moves up and down. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I mean, if I can explain very briefly, all you need to do at that point is you've got your chamber, you've got your bed, you've got two slits so this can move. So this can be, this means a high, high temperature chamber. We're talking about absolutely zero electrical components outside of steel and the print bed inside that chamber so we're talking 200 C and so forth um, 200 or higher there's not it's really whatever the the limit of the print bed is for us it for us it's PEI so it's 187 C um, but the thing is so you've got the head moving up there and our design is as simple as you you attach a block a, a heat block on the top and you have a gasket on the top of your chamber so our design lends itself to doing that and you've got yourself a high temperature heated chamber 3D printer. Thing is we haven't built it. Now the concept is absolutely simple. It avoids all the bellows and the complicated mechanisms that the other people have on, on 3D printing. So that is mm -hmm. a change, a game changer for 3D printing. Meaning you can yeah. now print with anything. Because right now it's, I mean, it's just a small, tiny, tiny subset of materials. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, but there are like some of the, I guess it depends on what plastics you're talking about using. Well, we're talking up to uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, ABS that's thin walled, you know, like you can't, you can't print ABS on a regular printer. No. Um, no. Anything. Not. So, so vinyl is a huge, vinyl PET, PET is a very common one. Um, yeah. But we're talking about anything, including things like the PEI itself, PEEK, uh, the high, the, the performance plastics yeah, yeah. and nylon and polycarbonate. So imagine uh, polycarbonate glazing, which we've done prototypes. We, in PLA, we print a double wall glazing for our greenhouse, just a little sample. It, it's great. Imagine if you can do it in polycarbonate and stabilize the materials. So um, 
that none of that happens without the high temperature heated chamber. So that's that's exciting. But we haven't prototyped it. We have the design, and, I, and we, yeah. we've got CAD CAD around that and conceptual design. Uh, last year we were trying to do that in our summer of extreme design build, but we never got to it. I mean, I, I think some of I mean we're we're working on recycling materials. So one of the yeah. things we're, we're I mean, we already recycle our PLA all of our PLA scrap. Um, uh, how do you do it? Do you have a like a small robot. We have a Philobot. Philobot, so, okay. Yeah, and we're working now on on taking standard water bottles, mm -hmm. you know, PTG and PET, and turning it into filament. That, that has a lot of. I don't know if you've done any of that. It, it has a lot of. We we ran a lime and filament extruder here. We did some ABS, uh, so, so we have a little bit of experience. And last year, actually, we were working on a industrial grade shredder. So that meant like a twenty horsepower shredder with. Yeah. Uh, CNC cut. We, we cut out some of the. We got as far as cutting out some of the blades on our CNC torch table, but mm -hmm. then the summer ended. Um, so yeah, talking about taking the large bells and and shredding that up. But um, t tell me, how did um, how did the fillabot work with with all that you've done? Like say PLA, is that very very works that easy or is that it, it, PLA is easy? Yeah. Um, I mean, and and it really. Um, I'm I'm a chemist by training, so I've yeah. kind of gotten into the. The, you know, the polymer science of this, any of the any, any of the sort of really um, uh, sort of real standard thermoplastics that you see are really easy to extrude. PLA and ABS are pretty easy. I've done some PCA ABS uh, okay. with, with um, that we had around for ejection molding that had an inorganic um, flame retardant in it that ended up being like a snap. Um, trying to do PET is actually, and PETG is a lot trickier because yep. it's a little bit more crystalline than ABS and PLA, which are pretty amorphous. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also very water sensitive. Um, so it, it's um, getting it to extrude as filament is, is a lot trickier. Yep. Um, you have to keep it really dry. Um, and that was a lot of it, but it, it, the, the the actual literature papers that I found that have gone into this usually end up extruding it into water. So mm -hmm. you quench it, to avoid getting any crystallinity, you quench it really fast. Um, mm -hmm. and air, air cooling doesn't seem to really do that very effectively. Yeah. Um, it also tends to degrade a lot quicker. So the studies where they've looked at uh, sort of tensile strength properties after it's gone, we've gone, we've through, gone through an extruder a couple of times uh, it, it it drops by like twenty or thirty percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You're probably you're you're going to have even more trouble with things like polyethylene and polypropylene, which are much more crystalline. Mm -hmm. uh, we we've, we've had some experience three D printing with polypropylene, and um, it it works, um, but it it's the it's because it's been. Uh, we were working with a company called Brascom, which makes this, was trying to get into the 3D printing space, and they heavily formulated it to make it directly usable for uh, an FDM printer. Um, Polypropylene? But, yeah, but generally speaking, I think if you took sort of off the shelf polypropylene and tried to mm -hmm. both make filament and both print it, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 uh, it does tend to crystallize really fast, so it's like it's like ABS on steroids. You get a you get a big internal change in volume, and it's just going to peel up all over the place. Um, but we were with the the commercial polypropylene. But hold on a second. Are you talking about this is uh, assuming a heated chamber? Are you talking about making the filament or heating heating the ch with with crystalline? The, the trick with polypropylene was you don't heat anything. In fact, you try to cool it as quickly as possible. Because if you if you heat it, um, because the, the TG is low enough, if you keep it warm at all, you get enough molecular motion that it will start to crystallize. And then that's where all the trouble starts. So what you actually want to do with polypropylene is you want to quench it as quickly as you can so you don't need a heated build chamber. In fact, you 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 know you turn the cooling part cooling fan on as high as you can, um, print it as low a temperature as you can get away with, and then 
just try to quench it so it gets below the TG very quickly and it doesn't have time to crystallize. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The neat thing about polypropylene, and, and you'll, you'll like this because you'll print the plumbing parts, is it's the only filament we've ever worked with that's watertight coming right off the build platform. So we've printed um, actually usable like uh, uh, like filter assemblies, and we were playing around with making like swage lock plumbing fittings mm -hmm. out of this stuff. Works pretty well. Um, you can get really nice prints, and it's water. It's, um, it's it doesn't leak even yeah. with there's So when you make your filament, are you talking about one? 1.75 yeah that's what everything we've done yeah, yeah we're we're doing we're starting off the bat we do just primarily 2.85 and in fact for the larger printers you want to go to like the, like the five we build our own extruders so um, that's an easy easy Easier. to make for us including uh like scalable we're into this whole modularity scalability thing so we build the the mm -hmm. extruders and scalable heater blocks that you can actually stack one on top of the other. Now that's that's just concept, but we we definitely on our plate is doing a super volcano so the pretty much the you know the 100 watt heater block, the lo the long one. Uh, and starting with that, that's kind of like our baseline if we're going to do any other stuff that's that's for for materials. So um, for the you know, build chamber you said that the the platform moves and everything and the the XY yeah, so the XY gantry is fixed on top. Okay, oh, so it's, just, like this, it's like the Stratasys machines. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that part of that is the fact that yes, this allows you to do this very simple heated chamber design because all you need to do now is plug up the top and the actual heat shield. It's not a bellows; it could be as simple as a sheet of PEI sure. that, that blocks the whole top, and there you go. And absolutely no, no, um, no motion components or electronics are inside the chamber. There's nothing there. It's just steel and have you, insulation. Have you seen the 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 strata? I think they called it Stratus has built a. I guess it's semi experimental, but it's an H printer, and and the idea was they want to be able to. Print H, it. You, you mean the fixed gantry? No, it, it's a. Uh, it, it was. I can't remember what what that designation was for, but it was mm -hmm. basically designed to be a continuous, yeah. Yeah. length printer, so you yeah. can print something yeah. as long as you want. Yeah. Um, and it was basically like one of their stand. It, it, sort of like a standard printer, but you would feed it. You it would start a print, and it was on a conveyor belt. Yeah. So yeah. it would keep the part moving, and the print head would stay stationary. And then it would feed out the other end, and that was in an oven essentially. But then there were flexible um, material at either side. And I think when you were talking about printing like plastic lumber, I mean, yeah, that's uh, those it, designs. It's, it's to let you print something long and thin without necessarily having a build plate big enough to really contain all of it all at once. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those the, the conveyor belt three D printers. There's also some open source designs out yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for the poly polypropylene, just to kill that one off, have you seen that one that prints from just regrind and it has like a very thick thick strand, like probably like six millimeter strand or so? Uh, I forget the name of it, but there's one guy who was doing that, and mm. apparently it was results were pretty decent uh, I, without I, a heated I, chamber. And yeah, something like I, that. I, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I I don't think you. For polypropylene in particular, I don't think you need a heated chamber to get good results. Um, you know, of course, you would for anything, any of the standard higher temperature. I mean, ABS doesn't even work that well without a heated chamber. Um, and the delamination but, issues on on polypropylene that that's nah, no, no, nah, we never we never saw any of that. Mm. It, it was it was hard. It was never easy to print anything that didn't have a very rounded corner. Um, it, it really did have a tendency to peel um, and warp, but if it, it's so like printing a dog bone was miserable. Any, anything with a sharp corner was really tough. And you know, when we, we kind of got into the practical side of it, and when you look at the things that are made out of polypropylene, they tend to be round. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, like 
disposable syringes and Tupperware and mm. you know, all those kinds of things. And we could print all of those. You get nice snap fits, watertight seals. Uh, it, it all worked pretty well, but yeah, it it it, it was always a bit you know, like getting it to stick to the build plate was yeah. miserable. Um, and I finally, a commercial product just came out that uh, I've tried. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Magic goo. That's okay. it. Yeah, and that actually worked pretty well. Okay. Um, I mean, which, which printer, printer did you use on it? Was it a Voron? No, that uh, we have a, a couple of um, Maker Gear and 3ID printers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's printing on glass with the magic glue, the magic goo um, on it. Before yeah. that, we were using a, a, a 3M polypropylene adhesive, basically gluing it onto the gold plate. But yeah, I, I think, I mean, we are, I mean, part of what, I mean, the Voron printers, they're the, the Z platform is stationary at the bottom, and then the whole X gantry, XY gantry moves up. So, um, but I, I'd be interested in seeing your design for the, for the heated build chamber, because that's something mm -hmm. that we'd like, you know, we, we would like to be able, I and mean, we do a lot of ABS on our Stratasys printers, but we'd like to be able to do that more routinely on our desktops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this is where if if, if the Denovo was supposed to su support this, it's a, it's basically people building it. Like I, I can feed you the design, but yeah, the, the time just to build it and and test it. So mm -hmm. so that kind of a. A time now for us, it's. I mean, the, the, the valuable thing is, it's not we're not just going to do like a single prototype and let it go. It's like, okay, let's take this to the product release, and that's what we're doing with the house right now. I mean, you know, we've been at it for a decade, but I mean, we're really finding out that we really have to take these things all the way to the products to get the to get the cash flows back out of the projects because people just don't take this up and, and take it to the finish line. Yeah, 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 no, I understand. You, you need, you know, you got to have some money to keep it going. Um, I mean, like the the plas you know, the plasma table was something that that I, you know, we we were looking at things like water jets and mm -hmm. decided we were going to avoid a water jet if we could because it's they're useful but they're a god awful pain to run and very expensive and messy and all that. So I I haven't I have never used a plasma table, but I assume you kind of use it like a water jet cutter. Uh, so. We have OxyFuel uh, on ours, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. Once again, the same same kind of a same thing. It's uh, <laughs> using a scaled up version of the the same kind of universal. We, we do this modular system called the Universal Axis, just simple uh, motion system. So we scale up the rods to one inch rods on that, and we did a uh, this the the last one we did was the four by four. Uh, four by four plate. Uh, let me show you some pictures of that if I can um, just, just take a look at what we were doing there. Um, let's see. Uh, copy that link. Can you see this link? Let's see. Do we have um, chat? Chat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does that link work for you? Uh, yep, yeah, should, yep, yeah, there we go. So, uh, so that's that, um, let's see, so it's a 4 by 4 by 8 structure, uh, just simple ramps-based controller with external stepper drivers, and, yeah, um, that's, that's that, like the whole build, how we were. So how, how it. thick, how thick, uh, metal can you cut with that? Five inches. That's pretty good, yeah. What's, well, like, uh, how, what's the kerf on? Uh, kerf, if you look at the last up on top, I mean, that's that's the kind of thing. It's, it's about, uh, you can get down to like a 16th or okay. like you see that the third picture there, that, that's a good representation. That's the pierce, that, that line there is like a 16th. Okay. And what, how fast does that it's, cut? I just don't, yeah. 20 inches per minute is standard for what we do for, for half inch steel. There, there we're doing some half inch steel samples that you see those blade uh, contours there. Those were for our shredder, which are half inch steel. And that is typical speed of 20 IPM. Okay. 
Uh, but if you, you got thin stuff, you can go way further. And like you see there, I mean, we basically took the whole uh, 3D printer system, including the Z height. We, we just used the probe from the 3D printer system to get the Z, because it has to follow the contour of the steel, so we, we use that to, um, to set, set the height correct. Okay. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's a project where, yeah, I mean, if uh, we, did, we actually do have the CAD and everything, so if there's someone who's, who can actually do it, we don't have like full blueprints for it. And this, this is a case where a little bit of uh, productization, that, that's, a, that's I think a solid product that we can put out, but once again, you got to productize it, so uh, clean it up and, so what, and package what, it. What, what things are you actually, so the, your, the desktop 3D printer, that's something you package up and sell? Yeah. As, okay. That okay. plus the brick press, compressed earth block press, okay. plus the house. Those are the things that we actually produce. And also the, the hydraulic power unit, which the power cube. Okay. Um, so one thing I can probably tell you is, I, I don't know how you got in touch with Novo. Um, I can probably give you some help on just orient, orienting around them. I mean, if, if you're, I mean, they are, they are very generous if they figure out that you're kind of in the space that they that they work in. Um, I mean, I Peter Buffett, who runs it, is he's a really nice guy and he's really interesting. Um, he does have a slightly he he has some expectation that there's going to be societal breakdown and black mm -hmm. you know, yeah. black supply yeah. chains and things like that. Yeah. So I think that was what kind of caught his attention with with what you guys are up to. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think the best point of overlap is the, the thing I mentioned called the Farm Hub. Mm -hmm. So they bought up um, uh, probably one of the largest, this area is very rocky and hilly, but there's a couple of sort of lowland areas along one of the rivers outside of Kingston that um, is a couple, I don't know, a thousand acres or so of really flat land, which mm -hmm. is usual around here. And they bought that up a couple of years ago and are sort of having like a, it's, it's like a farm training and they're trying to use sort of modern practices and mm -hmm. trying experimental stuff. And I, I tried to get somebody from there to, to join us today, but. Um, yeah, I take just, a look at the link. That's the micro track, which is actually the thing. We actually use it to grade around the CD go home, but that's, that's actually closer to product release than any, than the larger tractor because we actually have tested this and used it. Well, we use our live track machines as well. Like I, I do that all the time to like uh, do grading work or forklift and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that there there will be great potential for that. Um, do you sell those as kits or are those fully assembled? We haven't okay. sold them. We we we, we okay. actually did sell four four of them. That was like a decade ago, and the, they were assembled. They were. Uh, all put together. That was the early version, like version version three of the, the tractor. I mean, if you want to see the, the whole history of the, just uh, tr we have a page called Tractor Tractor Genealogy. I mean, we, we've gone through like nine prototypes or so. So we're, we're constantly developing it. Um, but once again, this is the where we said, okay, our beachhead product is going to be um, the house, because everyone's interested in the house, mm -hmm. and we then throw in the 3D printers and the mach heavy machines as far as part of the infrastructure used to build it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, okay. I mean, you can go through all the versions we have built on this page. Okay. Uh, this one. Yeah, because I, I think, I mean, that would be something where, you know, I, I you know, especially like collaborating between, I mean, we're going to have staff in the maker space and collaborating between the farm hub on constructing some of this kind of thing. And and this is the kind of thing where even if it doesn't necessarily, we're not buying, you know, we don't end up buying this directly from you, I think Novo would, would you know, would probably be interested in supporting you in doing this kind of work. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the question for us is, is like, I mean, we've got. I basically, I'm talking to Martin 
So, so you, you talk to him? That's your contact? Yeah, that's who I work with, yeah. So I'm trying to explain to him that, you know, it's a little productization right now. We've spent a decade pr proving all the concept that this actually works and is productive and, and the repairability issue. Like, for example, when whenever, what, you, you've seen my TED Talk? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the tractor broke down, it was two week downtime, it broke again, 2,000 bucks. Well, right now, if something like that happens, for example, the engine goes out, I take out the actual power cube, put a new one in, I'm back in, on in, in action in two hours. Nice. So, and yeah. that works. And, and so the lifetime design promise is absolutely real. And that's where you get like the 10x efficiencies, because you decide then uh, when you, you want to retire your thing or recycle the parts. We use modular wheel units like the wheel units we use are also interchangeable between devices um, okay. of course implements and the power units all interchange and we've built when we did a big plant out of nut trees around here we built a um, flail mower slash key line plow uh, traction machine and took us two days with four guys to build that tractor it's, okay. it's it works amazingly well when you have the modules ready yeah, and it, and it, I, I mean, I actually, I wanted to, I, I saw you started off just outside of Madison, and I, I grew yeah. up, around, I grew up around there. Oh, did you? Yeah, um, w Windsor, was 10 miles north of, of Madison. Yeah. Um, and, it, I mean, and I think in a, in a sense, you know, some of the things that you, you put together are, make more sense for the farming community around here, where it tends to be um, a lot smaller farms. Yeah, you know, yeah. and and also a lot more uh, truck farms. You know, we have mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of the the farms around here are based on on bringing, uh, you know, going to farmers markets and selling you know fresh fruit, fruit and veg directly to especially to people from the city, New York City. Um, you know, there's no very few sort of large, you know, large soybean corn. Uh, wheat farms that where you you know they're the eco economics of scale of getting a large size you know uh, harvester combine harvester kind of make um, for better or for worse makes sense but you know the operations around here they just don't do that kind of farming yeah so they need smaller smaller more um, uh, uh, flexible equipment that you know is easier to keep running and fix, mm -hmm. and I, that's why it really seems like a great fit for the farm hub. And yeah. I'll, I'll I'll try to push that with Martin because I think you know that's that would be something that would really make sense. I don't know I don't know if they were interested in the housing. I, I don't what what's what's your housing thing like? I, I didn't quite get a sense of. Yeah, so it's a it's a house that. A thousand square foot house that uh, you can build for a hundred thousand dollars. So okay. it's affordable housing. Well, other thing is it's completely open source, of course. And if you just download the plans and build, it, the promise there is that if you it, once again it's modular design. Actually, this house is the same four by eight wall modules typically, and, and just try to keep the design as simple as possible so a novice could build it. But um, the idea there is if you build all the modules ahead of time, so for example, you can do it on weekends, then it should take you two weeks with you and a friend to actually assemble that on the foundation that's there. So that's the promise. And, and if you can do that, then you've spent $60,000 in materials and you've got this high quality house um, that is off grid, actually. So six kilowatts off grid is a standard feature on this. Okay. Uh, the way it looks, um, Let's see, do I have any pictures lately? Well, uh, if you looked at the CD Go Home 2 link, that's, the rendering is quite accurate there. Um, it's, it's, we're still, um, the exterior is finished right now. We're working on an interior right now. Um, but the idea there is, uh, so that's not the only thing though. The, the production model is interesting because uh, our next step here is an apprenticeship. Uh, we've explored a lot with swarm builds. So the house I live in right now was built with 50 people in five days. Mm -hmm. And our production model is 24 people crew. We go out to a site and we're done in a week. So five days, 1,000 hours, um, 
of build time. We're keeping very rigorous track of all the ergonomics and time requirements for every step. Design is as simple as possible. Uh, so that if you go into business on this, that's not eight months, but five days per house. So okay. that is um, way and to you get assemble, it. And, and you assemble the modules, you know, like you put them together in a shop or a garage or something like no, that? No, this is raw stock that comes to the site on a 40-foot trailer. And five mm -hmm. days, we build everything from, from Home Depot and Menards parts. Okay. Uh, the other part is is selling kits. That's different than the. We think the mainstream production model will be. It's it's just like anyone else builds from raw materials, okay. uh, and that's all in five days. So that's that's unique, and that's why we're really excited about it because this there's cash flow in that. Therefore, we can bootstrap the further developments here, in cohorts of twenty four. So we're actually an education organization, and the way we do it is, uh, twenty four people cohorts um, for this. So that's the apprenticeship that. Uh, we're in contact with so with Martin. He was uh, interested in funding that as a solution for affordable housing. Yeah, I could see their interest in that. Um, and more than that, a job training program because we also have a vet veterans apprenticeship through the Department of Labor. It's already been set up, and we're just um, working on getting the infrastructure uh, here. And that's with De Novo's help. We, right now, we need like about half a million of infrastructure for a new new workshop and housing. Uh, to make this go here. Okay. Yeah. Very neat. That's impressive. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I, I, where I, the maker space is in part just to be a center for a lot of stuff like this because, you know, we need to at least train people in basic carpentry and, um, you know, just yeah. how do we take measure level. And so, yeah. you know, we, we plan on doing a lot of. You know, sort of basic classes for youth and adults, just just to get them used to being able to do at least basic woodwork for a start, um, as well as as digital fabrication and, and eventually metal. Um, I noticed I, my my colleague Kat, um, the first thing she noticed in your construction set was that there wasn't any uh, fiber handling equipment, and I was wondering what her her comment was. Well. Why not? Like, so the needs for civilization uh, clothing is kind of right is up there. Yeah, the top, but, yeah. Um, and that's more like with um, the digital fabrication capacity within this set. Then you can produce secondary machines. But yeah, that that is a that is a hole in there. Mm -hmm. But but we don't see it as that big in a sense of like one of the metrics for selecting was well how accessible is this stuff right now well clothing tends to be pretty cheap these days so we didn't that was probably the biggest reason why we didn't yeah. uh, put it in there yeah and i with, with the with the things like the micro tractor i mean do you, is there i, I might do you have like a um i mean is there some place where you know you collect feedback on sort of where people are having trouble with things breaking or uh, like a get github basically for for the uh each you know, each project has a development template that's we, we store it on the wiki and then cad files might be on github or something like that mm -hmm. but the problem with that is 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 that is uh no one has replicated the the micro track for example there were a couple of people who did <clears throat> life track mm -hmm. um, those long time ago the early versions but that's the thing it's like we thought that just by putting the plans out there uh, this would be a world revolution like with a brick press when it worked amazingly we you could build it for five thousand dollars and the next competitor on the market is fifty thousand for the same throughput we thought that this would go wild but didn't. Now, there were like a, about a dozen replications worldwide over the, the whole time but mm -hmm. I mean, nothing like any serious traction. Uh, like for example, there's one guy building a house in France right now, things like that. It's but it's just a trickle, and that's the thing. We we have to really put out the finished products that people can get their hands actually on. Use. Yeah. Uh, nobody can. Nobody has the skills these days to actually you know, to, to build something to build that it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's the that that is a real problem. Um, so that yeah, that's the gap. I mean, as far as our apprenticeship, that's the whole core. It's like let's get people on a path of lifelong learning, where they're the designers and the builders and 
just just a more integrated skill set. So that's the that's the big and, thing. And and everything. I mean, are, are all the 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 larger equipment? Is this all uh, run off of internal combustion? Uh, so it can be run off any kind of uh, power unit. The hydraulic power unit we have has a gasoline engine. We've built ones that have electric uh, mm -hmm. electric ones. So. Um, our sites are particularly on, in terms of renewable energies uh, on hydrogen resources. So, so after the house, we're we're looking at uh, there's going to be the release of the all the full building infrastructure, including the tractor and 3D printer. But after that, I mean, we got to go to the hydrogen. That's I don't yeah. know if you think about that, but, but I mean hydrogen in internal combustion engines. So right. very simple, yeah, well, I've, simple I've proposition. Been, I, I you know I've I've had discussions with Martin because they. I, I, I don't entirely agree with them about the potential for, you know, sort of complete, they, they want Kingston to be relatively self-sufficient, and I think that's kind of pushing it a little bit. Um, but it's, it's interesting to speculate on what you're going to use for a power source if there is actually some kind of, you know, uh, societal breakdown. And, um, I mean, I always come back to it's, there's a lot, there, there are many more ways of generating electricity than there are of generating, um, making liquid fuel, well, especially gasoline. Gasoline is horribly difficult to make. Um, you know, you can distill ethanol, you can, um, you can ideally electrolyze water into hydrogen. So that's, you know, if you can get electricity, you can make hydrogen. Um, but then hydrogen's kind of a pain to to store and transport and compress and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know what the right, I've never really, I'm not sure what the right solution is. It may depend on where you are. What do you think is the biggest challenge to storage and compression? Because I mean, people have had the compressed tanks, composite tanks for a long time. I mean, why is that um, supposedly well, so intractable? It, it, it's, uh, I mean, at least my understanding is that the like a standard compressor, um, you know, that works with like methane, you know, doesn't work very well with hydrogen. Um, so it you need you just need higher grade materials, better seals, um, to be able to store to be able to compress hydrogen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, having having looked at that, I'm like, well, that's that's all possible. How yeah, it, absolutely, and it's like that's much simpler than making things like nick, like your lithium batteries, and much more environmentally sound. Why are we even going to to the lithium part? That that to me is is I think a big myth, or I think it's in my view that's just technological Ill illiteracy on the part of the public. Mm. Yes, there are challenges to hydrogen, but. To make a high pressure pump like that with better seals and different materials that do not embrittle and things like that that's much at least in my opinion that's much easier to solve yeah. well but we we also i mean i don't think we have a really energy efficient way of making hydrogen yet i mean that that's one area that that i do follow professional um, even if you have your older electrolyzer designs that aren't in the 90s, they might be, what, 60, 70, and you combine that with a price of photovoltaics that is now 30 cents and lower per watt, mm -hmm. uh, that makes to, we did a, we have an off-grid system on this, and our cost on this is about two cents per kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. considering the, the panel cost and the overall system. With two cents, you're getting to competitive price. I think that comes out. You're at, at that point. I think you're about two dollars if you consider your electrolysis cost for for a kilogram of hydrogen or gallon of gas equivalent. Mm. So the numbers are absolutely amazing. I've been following this since uh, since '95. Since I uh, I got introduced to this at Princeton at the Center for Energy and, and Environmental Studies. Like that's that's where I met uh, it was Bob Williams, who, who's one of the proponents of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And since then I've been following, but right now, at that time, you know, 10x the price right now with a PV cost that is so low right now, this is absolute low-hanging fruit, and I believe it's just technological uh, illiteracy that, that makes people depressed that we're going to end yeah. civilization because we're going to run out of 
fossil fuels. I think that's completely no case for that. No, I, I, I agree. I think there's good solutions. It's just, um, I mean, the, the the nice thing about hydrogen is that it it's decent. It, it's also yeah. decentralized, and and that's I think what we have to be, you know, we, aim, we have to be aiming at. Have you tried tried actually putting together an electrolyzer and making your own hydrogen? Have I done that? Yeah. Not outside of just just uh, Small scale. science class level, um, but um, I do follow it a bit. Like there's a new company that that's talking about these modular electrolyzers that are like racks. You you scale them up to whatever size you want. Um, I mean. I look at it as much as I can with my my background in technical training, and I see this as um, I'm quite optimistic about it. Um, the, the technology yeah. that I was really interested in, the, um, there's a guy, Dan Macera, who, uh, who's at MIT, I think he's at Harvard now, who he actually um, he had an inorganic catalyst that would photochemically split water into hydrogen yeah. and oxygen, and mm -hmm. it didn't. It just didn't scale very well. But what he was working on was then taking hydrogen and finding a catalyst that where you can combine hydrogen with CO two to make mm -hmm. long chain alcohols. Yep. And liquid fuels are always going to be easier to handle. And that was that was the technology that I felt like if you nail that, then then you really solved all the issues because then then you've got a liquid fuel that you could use essentially the way we use gasoline um, and you know you may you may lose you may lose some efficiency in the trans in the in the doing the chemistry but you know it, it saves a lot of headaches in terms of of you know carting your fuel around with you uh, you think that uh, tell me how you think about the, the storage issue there because once again, if you have the high pressure tanks that are 200 atmospheres, um, it, it's why is just that? right. Well, it, it there's a lot more things that can go wrong carrying around 200 atmospheres of a gas than uh, a tank full of liquid at at atmospheric pressure. I mm -hmm. just you know I you know, and it depends on who's using it. I mean, you know, anyone who's, you know, an experienced scientist and used to working in a lab with equipment can probably make that safe. But to engineer it so that anybody can work with it safely, I mean, people manage to screw up just about anything, no matter how well it's engineered. Um, and, you know, I, I, I avoid doing plumbing just because I don't like dealing with leaks and having to run high pressure hydrogen through everything is um you know i i i would rather avoid that if i could but you know i you know it depends on what you have to make work and i think you, you you're absolutely right you can make it work um the one you, and that that was sort of the one thing i wanted to ask about sort of when you're thinking about designing the equipment i mean do you put in sort of the same the same kind of um safety interlocks that comes on commercial equipment um uh, if we're going to be making commercial products then absolutely this is i mean open source is just a dev development methodology it's just that you're collaborating openly with open results but mm -hmm. all the safety the, the certifications like for example with a house you, you submit the plan so everything is code compliant it's the same thing it's just somebody's got to do it and the difference for us is that once we open source the designs then the next person can take that to their building department and it's just lower cost for the people downstream to make it happen but somebody's got to do it like if it's uh if it's our tractor and it's got some certification for europe or a car in the united states it has to pa pass a crash test well we'd have to we have to fund that Right, but that has to be funded once if it's for that specific model, and therefore you could make it work just like anything else. So, yeah, that has to be a part of it. That's that's just part of the product development, uh, just normal product development methodology. Okay. Yeah. Well, what, what I'll do, I mean, in, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm really impressed by you know what you're what you're doing, and I, I think it's really valuable, and I, I would, um, and and I think the easiest. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what Novo is doing on sort of the housing front. That's that's mm -hmm. something we haven't been part of. But yeah, I th you know, the the farm hub is like a perfect overlap, and you know, that's something that I'll I'll really encourage Martin to think about um, because it it's 
you know that that makes perfect sense with everything that they've done and i i just i haven't had direct interactions with the people at the farm hub that this would be a i've been so, so running with them and this would be a nice way of doing it so what do you think is the value proposition that you can uh, sell to him well i i think the the point would be to have the farm hub you know work um um you know actually you know, make some of your open source design. And, you know, from the point of view, you know, the finance point of view, I know work, you know, if we download your designs and work on it, it doesn't necessarily directly benefit you. But the way Nova works is that they will, any organization that they're, you know, finding valuable information from will tend to support. So, um, and we will look, look at the the three printers. Um, I mean, we're we're about a year away from opening mm -hmm. the makerspace and um, probably getting the digital the fabricate digital lab open up and running is will be the first thing we'll do. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I would like to we'll take a more careful look at your printers. We're thinking about just getting Prusas. Um, yeah. You know, because that's they're you know easy and cheap and open source and you know great for safe for kids to operate and stuff like that. Yeah. But you know, if we get it, if we do anything bigger, um, I'd like to take a look at what what you've got. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there's possibility with respect to the the angle of okay, here's the things you can download, but I mean that's how you get it to unless you put in the continued development effort it goes nowhere so i think the real thing to do is i mean how do we uh how do we communicate that to martin in terms of well this is the standard development process you have to put in put in the time to turn it into a real product otherwise whoever's going to be downloading it they're going to be working with a mess it's not a fun process if, if the stuff is not mm -hmm. refined or if you can't just hit buy somewhere or get support well, that. I mean, I guess what would you like, like with the, with the micro tractor, like where would you like to see that go? Fund the product release. That means a few engineers working full time, uh, like a team of four. I mean, this is the standard startup process. Like we've got that prototype, but there's a, when you have that and you use it and it works, awesome. I mean, that's what I do but mm. on a special use case. So to, to productize it, that means the, the packaging and the productization part, which is probably more than all the time it took to get to this actual build. So it's it's funding the, the product development process to a product release. Okay. Um, that's what needs to happen. And, and I'm clear about that right now. I, I mean, I thought that just like with the brick press, published in 2008, and I thought there'd be hundreds of enterprises starting up from it, and there's mm -hmm. zero that I know of today. So, so we appreciate that you have to make it easy. If it's replication, if it's re uh, enterprise or replication, widespread replication, one, you do the product, but the second part, what we really do is train entrepreneurs and people to run this as a business. So for example, with the tractor, it's like, okay, here's the tractor, here's how you can run a farm with it, because now you're developing farming models around with this diversified equipment pool, so small scale CSA that are feasible or whatever, where you can actually manage this equipment pool because it's modular and highly, highly integrated. And then there's the aspects of, okay, here's how I become a manufacturer of these tractors so somebody else can get them. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody replicates it in Kingston, uh, the prospects are not great if we don't get to that final level of not only the the design perfection, so meeting or exceeding industry standards for comparable mm -hmm. equipment, and in the distributive enterprise sense of distributed economies, here's how we teach others to build it and start enterprises in their own communities. Those are the two that, things. That, okay, that'll resonate really well with Novo. I mean, that was one of the things that they wanted to have as the out, outcome of the makerspace was, um, especially it's it's cited in a in sort of a low income minority neighborhood in Kingston, and they were really mm -hmm. looking to bring in, you know, sort of local residents and and give them some job skills and especially give them you know some entrepreneurial, and but if we can have like, you know, some examples of things that you know are good directions for people to go into, that that would be 
a good possibility. Productize the micro tractor. It's a small device. It's a like a walk. It's a walk behind tractor. It can carry on any implement. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good one to start with. It, perhaps as opposed yeah. to the bigger tractor, you can right. cut it digitally in your in your lab in your fab lab. Uh, it's all it's all in FreeCAD right now, so you can actually take the cut out the parts and stuff like that. Um, I think that's that's the big part. It's about the part. What's well? Okay, so let's back up to the global village construction set. Anything in there is a billion dollar or more market. So tractors mm -hmm. are like a hundred billion dollar market. But that's what we're talking about. We're actually saying develop this to the point that people have an option between John Deere or Toro Dingo, walk behind tractor or open source ecology and many businesses and communities everywhere. That's what we're talking about. We call that distributed market substitution. It's where the common products everywhere are now turning into a case where the people own the technology again. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, you, I'm sure you know about the tractors with the proprietary code that when they break, uh, you have to take it in. Uh, have you heard about this, the, the owning no, the tractor? I haven't. Oh, well, a lot of the John Deere owners are pissed right now because uh, the code, the proprietary code, if it breaks, you have to, you can't even make it work. You have to take it into the repair shop. You can't work. You're not allowed by law to, to yeah, own that's a tractor. It's the same issue with, yeah. Well, my dad has a 48 Ford tractor, which, you know, it's it's basically like your open source tractor. It's, right. uh, you know. Yeah, the point is you can't do that, and that creates this amazing dependency, and there's been a lot of hubbub around that. All the people in your farm hub will probably know that story, yeah. but that's it's, it's like you don't own it. I mean, is, is that the... Is that would that be like the top of your list of anything that you know to take you know to refine and get to a product stage? Yes, it's the three D printing, the high temperature three D printer plus mm -hmm. the the tractor. Yes, and the, the house we've got under control. That we're going to start producing for customers next year, including a couple of builds this year. So if Martin wants a, an affordable housing settlement around Kingston, yes, uh, hire us. Uh, well, and, and after that, uh, yeah, tractor, 3D printer, brick press. The other thing that, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? I can hear oh, you. I guess we're back. All right. Yep. Uh, yeah, the, the other thing that, I mean, I, I'm dean, dean of the School of Science and Engineering, and we, all yeah. of our engineers do a year-long senior design project. Yeah. This is the kind of thing where, you know, that would actually be a neat project for them to say, okay, take take this and start tweaking it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you yeah. have to make sure that you have the continuity issue solved. So if the one cohort goes and it's not complete, then you, you need to... Yeah, someone else picks it up and knows where um, they're at. Yeah. Or if you have enough people in that class and you have them all go on the one project, yes, that's a one-year project with 12, 24 people. Yes, you can, you can get major motion forward. And that's actually like a... Uh, I was trying to explain to Martin this thing that uh, as far as the fab labs, what I wish they did, because it's everybody that works on their own project, right? The fab lab, the fab academy. Mm -hmm. um, I tried. I, I would promote like, what if you got all the 500 people that signed up for the fab academy to work collaboratively on a single project that they turn into an economically viable product? That yeah. would start changing things, and that's the part that's missing. People think that there's open source design. Very little good design exists out there that's usable, uh, including a lot of our stuff. It's, it's all work in progress. Um, yeah, so, well, I, I'm yeah. not really bought into the Fab, Fab Academy model. I mean, I, I, I mean, first of all, they're they're very limited in their tool set that they use. It, yeah. It's, I mean, it's it tends to be small scale and and yeah, um, not not you know. Small devices, small electronics, not nothing like this that that's at kind of a useful scale. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think. Yeah, I mean, the Fab Lab, the Fab City concept could be the next engine of production, but that's just not the kind of vision that they're ex executing at the Fab crowd. Well, and and you know the problem you you saw is that the, what the 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 skills that the Fab Academy teaches somebody, I mean. It's designed as it's still designed. It was designed as a course for for MIT students, right. and it really hasn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. And so it's designed for people who are already engineers or computer scientists. It's not for 
people who want to go out and run a farm. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, so they, they just don't have the scale of tools to be able to make this or really an interest in it. I mean, that's not what, you know, how long does it take to to put one of these together? You know, oh, which one, the, the tractor? Micro tractor, yeah. My, the micro track that we currently use, did you see the, did you click on the link? Yeah, yeah, I haven't started. That micro tractor we built in, a, I think it was a, a four day workshop with a crew of 12. Okay. Good, okay. And that's still figuring stuff out. So actually when we kit it out and we didn't even cut any of that stuff digitally, we all cut it by hand. So, mm -hmm. we, I mean, we're talking about a day you know, one machine, the brick press right now, we can build with 12 people in one day. Okay. So it's, we really pay a lot of attention to getting down to, okay, these are your IKEA style fabrication diagrams and instructionals plus the digital design where you can get the parts r readily. Mm -hmm. That's that's still, the promise is still there, but nobody's, I mean, my frustration is that I mean, outside of the work we're doing, I'm not seeing much inspiration of people who are taking on an integrated process of saying, okay, here's, we can uh, do open design for all this stuff, combined with the open source micro factories. That's, you know, everyone talks about it, but I, I don't see many people doing that. Yeah, it's, it, it yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to bridge that gap. I mean, it, and, you know, either you're, you're a farmer and you've already, yeah into the, the modern system or you're not a farmer you don't need one and it, it, yeah I mean but that's why I, I think that there might be you know because the farms around here are just very different than you know what you what you get in the Midwest yeah you know, smaller and, and um, you know it, it's it's a very it's a very different well and it's like my dad lives they don't farm, but they live on 40 acres of hippie land out, out in western Wisconsin. Um, that's mainly bluff. Um, but, you know, there, there are people who sort of run small organic farms out there or something like that. Yeah, right. Yep. Yep. Just south of there. Um, I'm sorry, just north of there. Um, where something like this might actually make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And it's just about getting the, to the completion of the design. And yeah. No, it would be, I mean, this, this is where, like, a foundation like De Novo, I mean, they could change the world if they, I think if, if Martin could comprehend the, the power of this idea, and I think he's kind of waiting for the technical leaders like yourself. Like, I don't think he listens to me much, because he, uh, I don't think we have a traction that's, uh, I'm not sure I'm in a good position to explain to him, but a person like yourself, I think, uh, and if other people actually start saying this, okay, this is the power, and now beyond the, the Fab Lab talk, Mm -hmm. um, that's when it could be become really compelling. But, but yeah, I don't know how to uh, how to communicate this to to Martin. If he yeah, were a bit I, more technical, he he would probably understand the feasibility aspect. I don't think he really believes that mm -hmm. as much. So so um, could well, that's coaching. where you know it's it's like this is the kind of thing where the, this is the kind of they wanted to see the the maker space doing interesting projects. Yeah. Global impact and this is this to me is you know you 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 just have to go in and try it and yeah, yeah. show that it works um and then and then go from there so that you know um you know we're gonna have to do some things that are gonna make a splash once the place opens and this this seems like uh you know as good a thing as i've run across as a as an interesting place to start yeah, I think there could be great power to the, the senior design class. Just take the tractor and show that that's built in a, in a new fab lab, in a new manufacturing center, and digitally cut and make some ways with it. That, that's a story. That's a great story right there. Yeah. Things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah, it's been great talking to you. I, yeah, I, yeah, you know, so. I really, you know, what you're doing is really inspiring and um, you know, I'll, I'll, let's let's try and stay in touch. Um, we're just we're going to probably you know another three to six months. You know, we're going to be working on just getting the architecture stuff done on the building, and then after that, we'll we're going to start really being able to think about getting equipment in there. And what, and what do you think about the high temperature printer? Do you think that would be a high priority for the center, or, or not really? Having having 
Yeah, I mean, I think what what I'd like to see, I mean, for, for an educational point of view, I like a bunch of sort of low-end, you know, simple PLA printers like mm -hmm. Lucusa. Yeah. But having a couple, at least a couple larger format, fully enclosed, heated printers, I think would would really be, would, would, would be necessary. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we want to try that as well, just because, you know, we're very dependent, I mean, our, it's, it's, you, you know, may, no matter what, it's never going to have probably the, the, the absolute tolerance that we can get with the Stratasys printers, but we often don't need that. You know, we just need to be able to print a decent ABS part without the damn thing warping, um, mm -hmm. you know, without getting five thousandths of an inch tolerance on it. So, you know, we, we had that intention with the Voron printers, and, you know, if you've got a better design, we would like to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can send you that. Okay. Concept. Yeah, please. Yep. Excellent. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Nice, nice chatting with you, and let's stay in touch. Let's stay in touch. Thank you. All right. Okay. Bye.